has done the foolish thing of helping organize and write a talk. So he is up next and he's going to tell us about programming with nothing. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to talk about programming with nothing. Um, so, uh, I love Ruby. Don't we all love Ruby? Uh, it's great. Um, I, I use it every day, pretty much. Um, it's a really expressive and flexible and, and sort of beautiful programming language. Um, it's got loads of features kind of in the language, you know, like uh, mix-ins and inheritance and all of the, all of the kind of uh, semantic stuff about the language that we like. It's got loads of great stuff in its core libraries and its standard libraries, and of course there are loads of, uh, loads of great gems for it. Um, so those are the main reasons why I enjoy using it. Um, in fact, I love it so much that I want to ruin it. So let's ruin Ruby um, by seeing how much Ruby can do if we remove all of its features. So by that I mean, Let's not use any gems, uh, let's not use the standard library, let's not make use of any modules, any classes, no objects, no methods, also no control flow, no assignment, arrays, strings, numbers, or booleans. Um, just before I continue, I've just got to say to you that this is just a game, it is not software engineering advice. <laughs> so here are the rules of the game that we're going to play. Um, we're going to be allowed to create procs and call procs. Um, also, for sort of practical purposes, I'm going to allow us to abbreviate bits of code with constants. So what I mean is if I'm going to make a big long proc I'm, and assign that to a constant, give it a name, and then use it again later, but that's really just the same as using that big string of code again. This will just help make it a bit more readable, and importantly, it's not lending any kind of utility to the code that I'm going to write. So the goal of this game is going to be to write the, um, the FizzBuzz program, which you probably all know about, but this is um, something that you can ask someone in a programming interview uh, just to check to see whether they are lying about being a programmer, um, because it's, it's ostensibly very simple. Um, you write a program that prints the numbers from 1 to 100. Uh, for multiples of 3, you print fizz instead of the number. For multiples of 5, you print buzz instead of the number. And for, multiples that are both, for numbers which are multiples of both 3 and 5, you print FizzBuzz. So this is very straightforward, and hopefully everyone in this room just knows how to do that. So given that I'm going to be using procs, let me just talk about procs for a second. Um, the thing about procs is that they're really just plumbing in your, in your program. They don't really do very much apart from move values around. So if you've got a proc like this, um, then what happens when you, call, when, when, you, when you do this call here is that the value that you've passed in, in this case 41, just kind of flows into the, the parameter to the block that you've, that you've given. Um, and then, of course, that value kind of flows to all the places where that parameter is used. And then, effectively, what Ruby ends up evaluating is this kind of 41 plus 1. So it's the rest of the language, the rest of Ruby, that does the actual work. The procs are really just kind of wiring bits of the program together. Um, Another thing to point out that some of you will know is that procs don't actually need to have multiple arguments, technically. Um, if you've got a proc like this in Ruby that takes two arguments, um, and then you, you pass in two arguments, you can just as well write that with a kind of two nested procs. You've probably seen this before. You know, if, you, if, if, if there's a proc here that takes the first argument and it returns another proc that takes the second argument, I can just call the first proc with x and then call the second proc with y, and it's exactly the same. Um, this is called currying, incidentally, and um, you, can, you can call curry on a, on a proc object to, to do this transformation. Um, another point to make, slightly more esoteric, is that procs are kind of, uh, they're, they're opaque, really. The only way that you can see inside them or do anything with them is just to call them. And one consequence of this, which is going to seem a little, bit, um, a little bit random to mention now, but will be useful later, is that if you've got a proc like this, which all it does is take an argument and then call some other proc with that argument, then that's the same as just using the proc that's inside. These two things do the same job. Um, this outermost proc here just passes that argument on through to the one inside. So the reason I'm mentioning it now is because this is kind of a refactoring opportunity, um, and you might be able to, if you see this in your program, you might be able to turn it into that, and for some reason you might want to turn this back into that as well. So just before I begin properly, I just want to make a little syntactic point. Um, I'm sure you will know that in Ruby there are several ways to create a proc. You can use proc.new or you can use kernel.proc or you can use kernel.lambda and in Ruby 1.9 you can use this kind of swanky stabby lambda syntax. Um, similarly, if you want to call a proc, um, you can use the call method, you can use square brackets, you can use triple equals in Ruby 1.9 in case you want to put your proc in a case statement. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> And you can also uh, use uh, round brackets in Ruby 1.9. Now, just for the purposes of like 
basically, th these are all equivalent roughly. I mean, you, you'll know that prox and lambdas are not quite the same thing, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to ignore that. Um, and I'm just going to choose a syntax. In fact, instead of doing this kind of lambda blah -de blah dot call, I'm just going to say stabby and square brackets, mostly because this just kind of reduces the syntactic noise and lets you concentrate on what's actually happening. I'm not, this isn't necessarily the best syntax for lambdas. It's just the most convenient for what I'm going to show you today. OK, go. So um, first of all, in <laughs> First of all, here is FizzBuzz written in Ruby. Um, I am available for freelance programming. <laughs> um, again, this is not necessarily the best implementation of FizzBuzz or the cleverest. You've probably seen some very clever implementations on the internet. This is just like, when I sit down to just write it straight out, this is what I would write without thinking about it. Um, so I'll say right off the bat that I'm not even going to try and implement this because it does a bunch of, it's got some puts statements in it um, which involve printing text onto the console, and I can't print text onto the console if I'm only using proc. So what I'm going to do is replace it with a roughly equivalent program, which is just mapping over this array of numbers from 1 to 100, and just uh, so I'm, what you're going to get out of this is an array of strings rather than printing them to the console. But hopefully you will agree that that is not too much of a fudge. Um, before I continue, I'll say that this is um, you know, s somewhat surprising. This is quite an ambitious program, really, if you don't have any of the features of a programming language, because we're doing, we create a range, um, and then we map over it, and then we do a bunch of arithmetic using the modulus operator. We use zero uh, predicate on those, on those numbers that we're creating. We've got some strings, and we've got a uh, number to string here, and we've also got a big condition around the outside of it. So there's quite a lot of functionality there that we're just using. So I'm going to have to go through and kind of implement all of this stuff without using any of it, just using procs. So first of all, what I'm going to focus my attention on is just these, all of the numbers that appear in this code and see how we can represent those and implement them without actually using Ruby's numbers. So how can you possibly represent numbers um, without using any, any data, you know, any of the data types that Ruby provides you with um, and only using code? Um, all the code that we, we're writing can do is make a proc or call a proc. Um, and pretty much the, the simplest way, although there are several different ways of doing it, the simplest way to represent numbers in this way is just to represent a number n with some code that calls some other proc n times. So what I mean by that is if I was allowed to define methods, which I'm not, but if I was, what I would do is say, well, I'm going to make the number 1, and that's going to be a method that takes some other proc as its first argument, and then some arbitrary second argument, and it just calls the proc with that argument once. Um, and then I could define two, which calls proc with that argument once, and then calls the proc again with whatever the result of calling it the first time was, and so on. I can keep going for ages like this. Um, also, there's a fairly obvious, um, if you extrapolate backwards, there's a fairly obvious way of imp implementing zero, which is just to say zero is the, is the method that takes a proc and an argument and doesn't call the proc at all. It just returns whatever the second argument was. So all of these I can translate into a kind of a methodless representation by just saying, well, I could represent this method one here as a proc that takes two arguments and then calls the first argument with the second one. And so it would look like this. So that's just kind of taking away the method definition stuff that I said I wasn't allowed to use. And instead, I'm just going to define each of these. You know, zero is a proc that takes some other proc and some value and just returns the second value and, and so on. So the, the main problem with programming like this is that if I were to type any of these on the console to Ruby and inspect it, it would just say, well, what you've got there is a proc. So I can't really make use of these without some kind of way of, you know, if, if I wanted to write some tests, for example, I would probably want my test to be able to test against Ruby values, not these kind of mental ones that I've, uh, that I've implemented with procs. So what you can do is implement, it, say, in your test helpers or in some kind of external library that is, the, that is interfacing with this mad code that you're writing. You could write something like this, for example. So you could say, well, I'm going to have a method called toInteger, which is going to take one of these procs that represents a number, and then what I'm going to do with that proc that represents a number is pass it another proc that just increments its argument, and then the thing that I'm going to ask it to apply that to however many times is, is zero. So if I, plug in, um, if I plug in zero into this, then I get a real Ruby zero back, and if I plug in three, I get a real Ruby three back. So I can also implement, I mean, for my fizzbuzz, I needed 5 and 15 and 100. So I, I can implement those as well. Um, <laughs> these aren't very compact definitions of those numbers, but these will work. And if I plug those into my kind of two integer method, I will get back the real you know, Ruby 5, 15, and 100. So going back to my fizzbuzz, um, all of those numbers, I can just replace them 
And, uh, you know, rather than inlining that whole massive term there, I'm just going to put the constants in so you can see that I've replaced them. So that's great. Um, I've got rid of the numbers. Of course, the problem with this is that that code doesn't work anymore because I was calling operations like modulus and stuff on those numbers. Um, and because Ruby doesn't know what they are, it, it doesn't do anything. So I need to go and replace all of the other operations in that code before it will work. So moving on to how I'm going to deal with the Boolean stuff. Um, how can I represent Booleans without any data, like using only code and only procs? Well, the thing about Booleans is, is that they are used for choosing you know, between two options. When you've got a conditional, you will say, you know, either if some Boolean, then this block, else that block, in which case the Boolean is just allowing you to pick one or the other. Or in Ruby, more often than not, what you're doing is saying, if some Boolean, then do this. And then in your mind, you're thinking, else nil. So <laughs> what you, the, you can take advantage of this by representing a Boolean with some code that is going to choose one of two values. So we can kind of cut out the middleman and say, well, we don't need some data that we're going to use to later decide which of those blocks we can choose. We can just implement Booleans as either something that chooses the first thing or something that chooses the second thing. So if I was going to write these oh, sorry, as methods, I could just say, well, true is this method that takes two arguments and returns the first one, and false is a method that takes two arguments and returns the second. So again, writing these as procs like that, you can see that that's a pretty straightforward translation. And I can do my kind of to Boolean you know, foreign function interface by saying, well, whatever Boolean you give me, I'm going to pass in Ruby true as the first argument and Ruby false as the second argument. And then if I do this, then it all works. So that's surprisingly straightforward. The only thing that's a bit rubbish about this is that this to Boolean here is kind of, it's not, it's not necessarily the code that you would expect to write. And it, in particular, it depends on the kind of the implementation of those Booleans. So what, I, what it would be nice to have um, is some kind of definition of if so that I can write something a bit, a bit more natural. Um, actually, I can implement if as a method really straightforwardly and just say if some Boolean, you know, x else y, I can just say, well, I don't have to do any work here at all. I'm just passing these arguments through to the underlying Boolean because it's going to pick the right one anyway. So this is really just sugar. Um, but I can write this if as a kind of a proc as well, and it looks like this. You know, if, give me a Boolean, and then give me an X, and give me a Y, and then I'm just going to pass those on to the underlying Boolean. And the thing I wanted to highlight here is that you can see, for example, in this proc here, um, I've got take an argument Y, and then something, and then just pass Y into it. So this is an example of one of these procs that doesn't really do anything. It's just handing arguments over. So I can actually get rid of that and say, well, let's have a simpler one. And then I'm in the same situation again. X is just being passed in and then being passed straight onto B. So this whole thing here is the same as just B. So actually, if is that, does nothing. Um, and that means that my, to, uh, that my to Boolean that I had before, I can actually write it slightly more nicely and say, well, actually, I'm going to call if with that Boolean, and then I'm going to put true and false in. So this is just layering up a little bit of sugar so that on the next slide, I can show you this if, else if, else if, else end, I can just replace with nested calls to if. So you can say if is taking, you know, this is going to return a Boolean, we hope. Um, and then this is going to be the kind of the true branch, and then the false branch is going to be another if, and then so on, nested all the way down to the bottom. So that's great. Um, moving on to predicates, um, what I want to do is replace that zero question mark and have an implementation of it that actually works with my procy integers rather than the real, the real Ruby ones. Um, so this is how I would implement zero question mark if I didn't have zero in Ruby. In fact, this is more elaborate than it needs to be, but this is basically what happens, right? You compare the number to zero, and if that is zero, then you return true else false. Um, now, looking at the representations of numbers that I chose in the first place, you can actually take advantage of these to implement this quite straightforwardly as a proc, because you can see that um, zero is the only number that doesn't call the proc at all. It just passes the second argument directly back to you. Whereas all of the other ones call the proc that you give into it at least once and you know, many times, depending on what the number is. So if I call any of these with, um, as, their, as their second argument uh, true, then that's going to come straight back from zero. But if all of the other ones, if I make sure the proc I'm passing in just unconditionally returns false, then I can do this. So I can say, um, give me a number. I'm going to pass in a proc that always returns false, and then I'm going to pass in true. So everything apart from zero is going to call that proc, and you're just going to get false back out, um, and only zero is going to allow the true to kind of percolate back out and be returned as the result. So I can turn this kind of zero question mark into a proc like before, is zero, and then just to confirm on the console, it does what I expected it to do. So going back to this code again, um, I'm going to replace all of the calls to zero question mark just with that guy. 
is zero. That's pretty straightforward. So I'm kind of making decent progress here. Um, now, the next thing I'm going to look at, and, and the last thing I'm going to look at in any kind of detail, because I appreciate this is quite tedious, is just making this, um, making this modulus operator work, and then the rest of it I'll just kind of scoot straight through so that you don't all kill yourselves. Um, so numeric operations. Um, so I'm not going to go into the detail of how these work, but I have kind of, out of a bag, pulled a bunch of implementations of incrementing numbers, decrementing numbers, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and raising to the power. Um, Hopefully, these aren't completely impenetrable. Decrement is impenetrable. But if you look at what increment is doing, this is just saying, give me a number, and I'm going to give you back a proc that takes some other proc, which I've called f here, and some argument. And then what I'm going to do is pass that proc and argument to n. So in that case, that's going to say, call f n times on x. So do what the original number would have done. And then just call f, call f one more time around the outside. So that's how you add one to a number. Um, and for all of these things, hopefully you can see that the way that we add two numbers together, if I want to do m plus n, that is just n times increment m. Um, and if I want to multiply m and n, m and n, that is n, n times add m to zero, and similarly for power. So these aren't completely opaque. So um, if I want to write modulus, then firstly I need to kind of know how to write that in the first place. Um, you might need to take it on faith that this is a, is a working definition of, of modulus. Um, so if I wanted to do 17 mod 5, then I say, well, if 5 is less than or equal to 17, which it is, then call modulus again with subtracting 5 from the number you're trying to take the modulus of. So uh, yes, 5 is less than or equal to 17, so try the modulus of 12 with 5, still less. Try the modulus of 7 with 5, still less. Try the modulus of 2 with 5. Oh, it's not less anymore. The answer is 2. So that's how that works. Um, I can't translate this straight into procs for you yet because I'm relying on this kind of less than or equal. So I'll just diverge slightly into that and then come back to making this work. So less or equal, if you were doing this in Ruby, would just be, well, this is one way of doing it. You could say if m minus n is less than or equal to naught. Um, in fact, the, the implementation of subtract that I've already showed you that I just kind of skated over, um, because all of my numbers are natural numbers, they're zero or greater, actually if I subtract a larger number from a smaller one, it kind of stops at zero, I don't have negative numbers. So I can implement this just as a proc by saying, well, I've already got is zero, and if I just subtract m from n, then as long as n is at least as large as m, then it's going to kind of stop at zero and not go any further. So that's a fine definition of less or equal, and I can just turn that into a proc, you know, take m, take n, and then do that thing. So going back to modulus, um, I can just translate this straight into a proc now. I can just say, well, it's got to take these m and n arguments, and it's just got to do this. I've got everything else, all the other bits in here now. So it just looks like that. Um, so that's great. Um, I've implemented mod, but there is a problem. <laughs> yes. And the problem is that it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so, if <laughs> so if I try to call this, then Ruby is just going to kind of dive off into an infinite recursive call and say stack level too deep. Now, um, it may or may not be obvious why that's happening, but the reason why it's happening is that when you s I've kind of missed something in the translation, um, which is to do with the actual semantics of conditionals in, in a language like Ruby, which is that if you say if and else in Ruby, then that statement is kind of, I suppose you could say that it's lazy. If you give it two blocks, and the first thing it does is it evaluates the condition to see whether it's true or false, and then depending on whether it's true or false, it evaluates either one or the other blocks. But the problem with our if implementation is that we can't take advantage of that. Um, we're just saying call this proc with these two other procs. Um, so Ruby goes ahead and kind of evaluates the whole thing um, before it even looks at whether to return one or the other. So the problem is, is that in this code, when we pass in an M and an N for it to do the modulus of, and it starts going down here and saying, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll evaluate this less than, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it gets to this bit, what happens is it just kind of says, oh, I know how to do mod. Um, I'll just go back up here and do whatever that says. And then, of course, you just get stuck in an infinite loop there. So regardless of whether this is less or equal bit evaluates to true or false, you don't even ever get as far as trying to choose whether you're going to return this one or this one because you just dive off into a loop there. So this is, a, this is a situation where the thing I showed you before about saying these two lambdas are the same, is these two procs are the same, is really useful because I can... I, what I want to do is, um, if you've ever done any rack programming, you might think about, like, deferring a body... What I want to do here is um, I want to tell Ruby to not evaluate this bit yet, just evaluate it later. And fortunately, if I wrap it in one of these kind of useless procs, so if I say, well, let's put a proc around it, and let's just say, take an argument, call it x, 
and then pass that argument in to whatever is inside there, then that code does exactly the same thing as before, sort of, but it will, it will not, the first time we dive into this function, it'll say, if, yeah, okay, yeah, evaluate this, yeah, evaluate that. And when it gets to this, this proc, it won't try to evaluate what's inside it because it's a proc, so that will be saved for later. But because the, the proc that's being saved for later does the same as the one we would have eagerly evaluated anyway, then that's fine. So by hiding that bit inside a proc, we can get a situation where when I call to integer of mod and three and two, I get the right answer. And you can see here, modulus of 27 and five is two. So this is when it doesn't go around the loop at all, and here it's had to go around the loop a few times. So you can see that works. Brilliant. But unfortunately, there is another problem. <laughs> and this is a much more serious problem because this problem is not in Ruby, but inside my mind. <laughs> So th the problem now is that, I'm sure some of you are fuming over this, um, I, I'm defining mod here, and I'm defining it in terms of mod. So this is not an abbreviation. I'm not using a con I'm not just kind of assigning something to a constant so I can use, use, it use it later. I'm actually relying on Ruby's sort of assignment semantics so that when I define mod, even though I haven't defined it yet, then that's fine because by the time I evaluate this later on in my program, mod will be defined and I'll be able to pick it up. Oh, that makes me cross. So, um, so that's no good. I mean, the reason it's no good is because, in principle, when I've written one of these programs that uses abbreviations, I should really be able to go back and sort of undo all of the abbreviations and say, well, where I said mod, what I meant was this ginormous expression. And, and I won't be able to do that as long as mod is defined in terms of itself. So you can solve this problem um, using the, the Y combinator, which is a famous bit of helper code um, for exactly this purpose, when you want to define a recursive function without cheating. And um, I'm going to sort of flash it up and you can all coo, but I mean, this is, I'm not going to explain how it works, but this was invented slash discovered by um, Haskell Curry in, the, in the, the 20th century. So this is like relatively recent mathematical technology. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, just like in the broadest possible strokes, what this does is when you pass it a proc, it will call your proc again with your proc itself as the first argument. So what that means is if you write a proc that expects an argument, um, then when you pass it to the Y Combinator, it will call you back, but it will give you yourself as that argument. So you can just, instead of referring to mod or whatever, I can say, well, my first argument is me. So if I want to call me, I can just call whatever I called my first argument. Um, but there is a, no, I mean, there is a problem with this. Um, <laughs> which is that for, for similar reasons to why mod loops forever, this guy loops forever, and we need to modify it. Um, it's these calls, uh, x applied to x, x applied to x, that are the problem. In fact, it's only the second one that's really the problem. But conventionally, what you do if you're trying to use the Y combinator in a language like Ruby is that you will do the same trick. You'll just kind of wrap the problematic bit in, in, in other procs, and this is called the Z combinator, which is, it is, which is just the Y combinator for languages like Ruby. The Y combinator only works in like batshit languages like Haskell. <laughs> and maths. <laughs> so, um, so now that I've done this, I can, um, I can go back to my mod that makes me sad and turn it into a mod that makes me happy by saying, well, what I'm going to do is put the Z combinator around it and say, well, this whole thing is going to take a new argument, F, and then where I was calling mod, I'm now going to call f. And I'm just going to trust that that z combinator is going to make this work. And, and it does make it work. Um, yeah, strangely, I haven't demonstrated that it works. But um, what, what I'm going to do is all of these places where I was doing mod, I'm just going to say, well, I've already got an implementation of mod. Thank you very much. So that's all fine. So I'm just going to, you know, I've got a few bits left now. Um, I've got the range at the top. I've got all the strings, and I've got kind of the, the number to string. Oh, and I've also got map. Um, so in order to do this stuff with ranges and maps, I need an implementation of lists. Um, the easiest way to implement lists, I think, in this kind of context is to use pairs, which are like two element arrays. These are quite easy to implement. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but effectively you say what a pair is, is something that can give you two things. So if I took to make a pair, I give it two things, and it's going to return this proc here, and this proc here is something where if I give it another proc, it's just going to provide those two things as arguments to it, and left and right are the things that just pick out the left and the right element of it. That's easy. Um, these are the list operations, so I'm going to use pairs to represent lists, you know, like a linked list has got kind of the value and then a pointer to the next one. I can just make nested pairs to make a list. Uh, yeah, just believe me, that's boring. Um, 
So if I want to implement range in Ruby, it would be something like this. This is a slightly contrived way of implementing range, but it's very convenient, so this is the one I chose. Um, I, if, I, if I want all the numbers from m to n, that's the same as all the numbers from m plus 1 up to n, with m sort of unshifted onto the front of the list. Um, and obviously, if they're the same, or yeah, if they're the same, then I don't have any. So uh, that's, that's it translated into kind of mad proc form. Um, this is all straightforward, really. I mean, I didn't have any problems there. I knew how to do recursion. I knew how to do if less or equal. I, I knew how to do unshift and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, you can see that the, uh, the range stuff is something I know how to cope with now. Um, moving swiftly on, there is an implementation of a function called fold, which is a bit like inject. It's not that difficult. If you, if you had to write inject manually in Ruby, it would look something like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also there's map, that works. <laughs> so, so swiftly, um, I can get rid of that map and just plug it in there. So um, I'm nearly done, all I've got to do is deal with these strings. Um, strings are pretty easy to handle as long as you're prepared to just kind of say, well, I'm going to represent strings as just lists of numbers. I've got lists, I've got numbers, um, all I've got to do is pick some encoding, so I, I'm going to have to decide I'm going to have an agreement between whoever it is that, is that I'm sending these strings to about which numbers represent which letters, which characters. Um, so looking at kind of what I would write in my helper library, in my test, in my foreign function interface, I've chosen a suspiciously convenient character encoding. <laughs> I, just, this is, this, I just found this in a textbook. This is the best, apparently. Um, so, so you, can see, you can see what I'm getting at here. If I've got a string, which is just a, a list of numbers, then I can first turn that into a Ruby array, and then I can map this to character function over it and join it to make a Ruby string. And you can see that I've arranged my character encoding so that the number zero maps to the character zero and so on. And then I've got B, F, I, U, and Z on the end, just in case I need them later. <laughs> um, here is... Um, yeah, oh yeah, so here's a function that can, you know, you don't really think about this when you're using a programming language, but this is the function that when you give it an integer, will turn it into a string. So this is on the assumption that you can represent every number with, or every, every number from zero to nine with itself. Um, what this is gonna do is just kind of look at the number and kind of chomp the digits off one at a time and just put them in a list. So again, just trust me that that works. Um, so you can see I can, um, I can use my to string implementation down here. Um, and then, I mean, I'm not even going to bother showing them to you, but basically I can, I can construct a list of numbers that represent fizz buzz and fizz and buzz using the character encoding that I picked. So I'll just swap that out and say, hooray, I have magically defined those. <laughs> so, um, so I'm actually done there. Um, there is the program. I, but imagine if this was an interview. <laughs> I wouldn't know whether to make me CTO or phone the police. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, so, so there it is. Um, and then, of course, I couldn't resist doing this. As I said, all of these constants that I'm mentioning are just abbreviations of some longer term. <laughs> so, of course, if I was really doing this in an interview setting, what I would, what I would rather do is just kind of replace each, con each constant with its definition so that I could show them the full program, because otherwise there's, there's no indication I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Maybe I'll see the number 100 up there. <laughs> so um, we're going to do questions in like two minutes, but um, I can already feel you thinking, why? <laughs> why am I doing this to you? Well, so the point of this talk really is just to illustrate that, well, or, or hopefully to gesture in the direction of convincing you that within these constraints, you can actually build any data structure and you can implement any algorithm. So as I said with the Booleans, there, there really is, in this setting, there is no data, only code. All that data is for is kind of a, a serialization format to control what the code is going to do. But you can always cut out the middleman and say, well, I'm not even going to have any data. I'm just going to use the code that would have done what the code that read the data that I would have had would have done, <laughs> if, you, if you see what I mean. Um, and also, uh, you know, just to say this, um, there is no programming language um, we don't know how to make a computer or how to make a programming language that has got more computational power than the arrow, th th than making a proc and calling a proc. Um, and for me, this was, uh, like, I think this is awesome. 
And I don't mean like, you know, old street roundabout awesome. I mean like, <laughs> <laughs> like this, for me, this was like, when I first learned this, this was like being a child and learning that every atom in your body that is not hydrogen, helium, or lithium was either synthesized in the heart of a star or, was, or in the subsequent supernova that distributed the matter of that star throughout the universe, right? I think that this is an exciting fact because it tells you what we, as programmers, are kind of made of, and I think that's pretty cool. So in the knowledge of that, um, and if you believe everything I've said so far, then what, why do we even have programming languages? Why doesn't everyone just use this? Um, <laughs> what is it that differentiates them? And of course, you all know the answer to this. It's that programming languages have got different degrees of expressiveness and aesthetic appeal, and some of them are safe and some of them are flexible, and that's a trade-off. Some of them are slightly more performant than the one I've shown you today. Um, <laughs> Different programming languages have got different qualities of ecosystems. You know, Ruby's got loads of great gems. Um, and Ruby's got a lovely community. Thank you all for coming. This is lovely. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that um, I, the reason why I wanted to talk about this, really, is just a really long-winded way of saying that these things are all trade-offs. Like, what you think is expressive may not be what someone else thinks is expressive, because maybe they're trying to solve integrals or process text files or whatever. But there, there is a sweet spot of all of this stuff for people like us, and Ruby is in our sweet spot. Um, there are many languages like Ruby, but this one is ours. Um, if you have been affected by any of the issues <laughs> in today's talk, um, then please phone us on github.com slash tomstuart slash nothing, where you can find, number one, like a shitload of specs for all of these things. <laughs> So I've, I've written um, some custom matches and stuff in our spec and exhaustive, believe me, specs for, to make sure that all of the stuff I've showed you and some other stuff I've skirted over works properly. Um, so if you're feeling brave, then you can sit down and try and make all these specs pass. That'll be fun, won't it? You've got an hour and a half for lunch. Um, <laughs> If you're not feeling brave, then I've also got another branch that's just got a load of commits that just walks you through them. So here, here's me implementing add, multiply, and power and kind of un unpending the spec. So if you, if you don't feel like actually doing it, you might enjoy, <laughs> you might enjoy walking through these. Um, and also, you can see me doing a bit of refactoring. So for example, here I'm um, having defined sum and product. I've injected a little, I, I've extracted a little proc called inject that you might recognize from Ruby. Um, OK, that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I know it's, a, it, and it's a, a funny question, but it's also an interesting question. Um, because firstly, this is, so this is just the, this took me quite a long time to do in text, mate. Um, this, this, this is just the kind of naive expansion of all of those things. Um, in fact, while I, I'm not dodging the question, but while, um, while I'm answering that question, then why don't I actually run this for you and convince you that it works? So uh, this, by the way, will take about two minutes to run. So this is why I'm doing it now, rather than at a more polite time. So uh, this should be in my buffer, um, if I paste. There it is. So, so, yeah, so that ran quite quickly. It hasn't really done anything. It's just made like a big proc that hasn't actually run yet. So the thing I want to kick off is to say strings equals uh, two array fizz buzz. Uh, so let's leave that going. Um, yeah, so. So this massive kind of proc term has got, it's got loads of, loads of stuff buried in it that, that can be simplified. Um, and you could, if you wanted to optimize this program, then what you could do is find all of, the, all of the places in it where you're calling one proc with another proc, and you can see what proc you're calling it with, because there's, there's really only, uh, I don't know how much of this can be reduced down, um, but I imagine that you know, what's going on here of it trying to turn all of those into an array, 
um, is actually doing a lot of work that I could have done ahead of time. So it certainly is possible to look at a term like this and find all of the reduction expressions that you could potentially just kind of pre-evaluate. I don't know how much smaller it gets if you do that. Um, I just wanted the slide to be funny, really. Um, but it's an interesting, you know, this stuff is quite easy to implement. If you wanted to sit down and, and, and represent, you know, this is the lambda calculus. Um, if you wanted to represent the lambda calculus in Ruby, it's quite, you know, all you need is a data structure that represents kind of making a proc and one that represents one, you know, a proc being called with an argument. Um, well, it's still going. Um, so it's all, um, it's, it's all to play for. And I mean, if you, if you sit down with any, any of this on a bit of paper, you can... Yeah, you can inevitably see that there are, apart from the arguments right on the outside that only get provided when you actually run the code, there may well be lots of little bits hidden down inside where you can see well, all I'm doing is, like all of those occurrences of if, I mean, I put them in verbatim, but everywhere I'm calling if, where I'm saying, you know, lambda b, b, I could just erase that and replace it with whatever the argument is. So there certainly are lots of places where it could be simplified. Um, so you can see that took a little while. Um, and also, all I've got back is a bunch of procs, so I have to... You know, I have to translate each of those procs into a string. So um, if I say strings each do, I can't even see what I'm typing. Uh, to uh, let's, let's print them out because they come out. A as you get further down the array, they take longer and longer to turn into strings, so because the numbers are getting larger and larger. Um, is that going to work? There you go. <laughs> Don't we have a look? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting point. Um, <coughs> yes, I called them lacking, right, um, because I was using first here. Um, th yeah, that's a very good point. So you can see, uh, as, as Tim helpfully points out, um, that this, like, this implementation of left here, uh, is that right? <coughs> oh, you were talking about this, weren't you? You were talking about... Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. So you can see that th this proc here, lambda, uh, lambda x, lambda y, x, lambda x, lambda y, y, actually are the same procs as, as true and false, but here we're using it to mean something completely different. So uh, there's, there's possibly an opportunity there to say something about the, the language that we're working in here is, is untyped. Um, in particular, if you look at the, the code on GitHub, there's this sort of you can't really write a function that will just show you, that will decode one of these things and tell you what it is, because it could be, it could be supposed to be representing false, or it could be exactly the same proc that is supposed to be representing something else. So there are all kinds of places, if you sit down and try to implement this, where you might end up writing exactly the same string of symbols to represent one thing that you use to represent another thing. And of course, it's up to you as the programmer in this language to make sure that everything is plugged together correctly. Um, and this is really why type systems exist, whether they're static type systems like the ones that you get in you know, C and Java and stuff that check your program ahead of time, or, or dynamic type systems like the one in Ruby that effectively just tags all of its values so that at runtime, when those values are moving around the program, they've got like a little tag on them that says, well, this is supposed to be a number or this is supposed to be a string, so that when you do the operations on them, you don't end up kind of... Like this program, if you try and work through the stuff in GitHub and make some mistakes, it just blows up in really spectacular and unexpected ways of sort of saying, you're trying to call plus on a Boolean or something mad. Um, and it's just because m mainly there's no way to differentiate these values from each other once you've stripped away all of the unnecessary artifice of, of Ruby. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I think we're, it's basically lunchtime now, so let's make this the last one. Sorry, this might be a stupid question, but how did you actually generate the expansion, that big slide with all the stuff in, the function definitions? Because unless you have your own sort of stitching together and set of things, how did you do that? So, I will tell you what I tried to do, which, which is that I was going to use, oh, what's it called? The thing, is it Ryan Davis, the, the Ruby parse tree thing? Is it called parse tree? 
there's a, there's a gem that you can give some Ruby code to. Um, and what I was going to do was get it to parse my big file that had all of this code in it, and then just say, well, find all the constants and replace each occurrence of a constant with the abstract syntax tree of the definition of that constant. Um, so I, I intended to do that, but then uh, at you know midnight last night when I was panicking, <laughs> um, yeah. Long story short, I just did it in TextMate. I just I, I, I sat down in TextMate and I spent 10 minutes copying and, pay and search and replacing. So I think. It would be interesting, and what I, what I wanted to have in the GitHub repository was a rake task that you could run and just say, like, rake expand that would read this file and I eliminate all of the constants from it and just replace them with these expressions. So you know, if anyone's bored, yeah, I think that would be a fun thing to write. You could just do it um, without parsing the code. You could just read the code in as a string and spot everything that looks like a constant and, you know, do it that way. Um, but I, That's very possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, that's a disappointing answer. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Paul.